so I'm going to tell you about uh, the story of MAP being uh, implemented and tested and debugged uh, and so on on VPP. Uh, and I would like to back what Keith said. Um, VPP is really a great way to help uh, specification and standardization because quite often when, when people go try to standardize something, they have no way to, to test it in real conditions. They, there is no way to have uh, tens or, or hundreds of gigabits of throughput with a technology that you can't, you, you, you had to basically put it in silicon in order to, to get that. And with VPP, you can quickly prototype, test, and maybe some of the mistakes that were made with, with protocol standards would not have happened if we could actually had uh, um, a way to prototype it and test it um, more efficiently. So uh, I'm going to go pretty quick on this because it's not really VPP, but in order to explain how, it, how I, we put VPP together uh, with Ule Troan, um, in, in VPP, I'm going to, to tell you a little bit about MAP. Uh, so MAP is an IPv6 transition technology. So IPv6 to some guys, maybe some of you, IPv6 is this, but so not even 1% of traffic. That was before 2010. Things changed since then. Uh, that, was a, that, that is a, um, the state before 2013, so it was increasing and, and reaching 2.2%. Uh, 25% uh, at the end of 2013. And pretty, pretty easily we see that it's an exponential curve. It's doubling every nine, nine months. This, this slide is, it was a projection made in 2013. So in 2013, we were here. And this is a logistic curve, expectations of what was going to happen. And so, Oops, sorry. So, and, and in 2013, okay, we could see that in 2016, we would be at 10%. And guess what? So we are in 2000. Yeah, I know. I was about to tell it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So we are, we actually were at 10% exactly in 2016. And yeah, exactly, John Brozowski, from Comcast said uh, a few weeks ago that by the end of this week, they will have 50% of their traffic that is IPv6 on their network. So we are growing. So we can, we can ignore IPv6. We, we could ignore IPv6. No, we can't because, you know, exponential, doubling every year. Next year, it's going to be 20%. In two years, it's going to be 50% globally. Uh, and if you want to know a bit more about IPv6 deployment worldwide, you can go to sixlab.cisco.com uh, and see IPv6 deployed in the countries you like or in the countries you do not like and see how they go. So with, uh, in order to transition to IPv6, this was a huge work and th there, was a, there was a plan. And the plan ended up in this thing. Uh, tons of technologies from how to transport IPv6 on top of IPv4, IPv4 on top of IPv6, uh, do double um, dual stack, and so on and so on. Uh, here you see a few FIDO logos. These are the technologies we have already implemented in VPP. And all this thing reminds me of this. You know this, this little story? So it's how our standards appear and populate. OK, so um, it, th that's how it works. We have tons of standards. It's very complex. And, and I mean, at Cisco, in our routers, we want to support them all. It's very complicated, and it's very expensive. Because silicon is not free. If you want more features in silicon, you have to put more silicon, more, more stuff in there, and th the chips get bigger and more expensive, and so on. With software, it doesn't happen. If you want to add a new feature in the software, I mean in VPP, for instance, you add new nodes. You put more nodes in your network. And if you don't use them, they don't get executed. But code is basically free. I mean, not for de development, but one, once it's there, it's, it just runs. So a little bit about how, what is MAP. So MAP is a way for CPE, so custom, uh, customer networks. To, they have a dual stack network in, locally. And it's a way for providers, 
uh, such as Comcast to um, have IPv6 only network and transport IPv4 on top of that network. So the real difference um, in MAP compared to other existing solutions like CGNs, I mean, MAP provides IPv4 address sharing. So you, you, you can have multiple CPs using the same IPv4 address. But the difference is that instead of having dynamic port sharing and having a big CGN box, I mean, that would be there, a big CGN box, uh, stateful stuff, um, no way to, to access from the outside, no way to, to, to get a real port connected. Um, the, 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 um, the way the ports are shared between different CPs is algorithmic. It's not, it's not stateful. So each CP is going to get its own range of ports uh, of one IPv4 address. I'm going to explain that just on the next slide. But the real novelty is that here you have, you have a NAT at the CP. Here at the border router, you don't. It's stateless. It's using algorithmic mapping. Uh, so you, you don't need all that complex stuff. And that's where VPP stands. The BR, that's, that's the implementation we made. And we have two types of map. There is the encapsulation tab. You know, remember what I said about standards? That's, you know, we have two ways of doing map. Uh, encapsulation or translation. Both are stateless. Even though it's translation, I mean, it's translation from IPv6 to IPv4 in a, sta in a stateless way. And about map T and map E, maybe some of you may remember that. It was at ITF uh, in 2012. They couldn't decide between MAP E and MAP T. Uh, so basically, they, conf they conflict. Uh, and, and the decision was that MAP was going to exist as MAP E and MAP T. So again, more silicon in hardware. We have to implement both. In software, well, we have both, and the code is almost identical. It's almost the same operation. And it, it's not such a burden. So I'm going just to show you, I just want to show you this tool, which is from far the best way to explain how map works. So this 56, for instance, it is what a CP is going to get from the ISP. It's, uh, you know, in IPv6, you don't get just one address. You get tons, I mean, billions more than you can imagine addresses, and you get a prefix that is a slash 56. And these bits here are going to be used by the CP in order to get an ID. This, this is sort of the CP ID. Some of that ID, the first bits, are going to be put in this IPv4 prefix such that the CP can know what IPv, IPv4 prefix it's going to use. And the, the rest of the identifier is going to be put in the port range. So the port is 60, uh, 16 bits. And you put some of these bits as fixed values. So one CP is going to fix these values. And this CP is free to use uh, to change the other bits. So that's what I, uh, I, I told about algorithmic mapping. There is, no, there is no binding table. It's just when, when you see an IPv6 address, you can guess what is the IPv4 address which is associated with it and what is the um, port. And if you, if you like map and you want to know a bit more, this tool is great. You can change everything. Uh, you can change the position of the, um, the, the, the bits you set in the ports as well. So that's it. So. Second thing which exists, it's a very similar, again, yeah, it's very, very similar to MAP. It's called Lightweight 4 over 6. So it's the same idea, uh, putting uh, V4 traffic within, uh, on top of IPv6 traffic, transporting IPv4 on an IPv6 only network, but instead of using an uh, algorithmic binding between the IPv6 address and the V4 address and the ports that one CP in particular is allowed to use, we use a binding table. It's still stateless, but the, 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 the provider is free to configure whatever binding it wants. So it's not algorithmic anymore. It, it's, um, it's a um, binding table. And the, the code itself is almost identical. So that was on a uh, general presentation of MAP. I, I hope you didn't get bored by it. Now we are going to talk a bit about VPP. So uh, we were two developers on this project, myself and Ule Thrun. Uh, and it took us about one month of real work to get MAP and Lightweight 4 over 6 
implemented uh, and running in VPP with line rate uh, performances. Uh, and, and it was our first project, so I guess that's an interesting point I, as well. Uh, I actually started working on VPP in uh, last November, and so we, it took some time for us to get up to speed. VPP is, I mean, it's very specific code, um, the VPP infra stuff, the vectors, the nodes, and so on. It takes a little bit of time. The, the learning curve is a bit steep, but once you get used to it, it's really great development uh, kit. So these are the different files we have. If you want to look at it, there is map HC, uh, IP4 and IP6 map. And as I said, there is map E, there is map T. So we separated the, the, the files. Map.c is for map E and map-t uh, is for map uh, T. We also support 6RD. Um, and this is also some part of the code that was uh, implemented for VPP. So if at some point in your, in your uh, use cases you need fragmentation, IP fragmentation, you can find nodes that are able to do that. It's not exactly, it, it's not very, very used in VPP because we don't have a lot of notion about MTU, so we don't really fragment a lot. But MAP is one of the use cases because you have IPv4 network on one, si on one side, IPv6 network on one side. You may have different MTUs, so we needed that such that uh, the, the solution is complete. Um, so why VPP? Oh, sorry. Hey, sorry, the question, the previous slide, uh, the 6RD you mentioned, right? Yep. So is it uh, now, just a curious question, is it, is it in deployment uh, compared to MAPI and MAPT, which is more? Uh, uh, I'm not aware of, of the deployment of 6RD with the VPP, but you know, it's open source, so I can't know for no, sure. You know, in general, 6RD. Uh, oh, 6RD, yes, yes, it has been deployed. Uh, I mean, not on VPP, but yeah, there is, a, but, well, I'm, I, I come from France, Free is using it. Uh, it's a it's a quite large ISP in France, and since 2005 or something like that, they 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 put 6RD. So it's uh, 6RD is, is the other way around. It's uh, IPv6 on top of IPv4. Okay. So um, what's really different, and what what uh, ISPs like about using uh, VPP for map, is its flexibility. So they, MAP is about transporting IPv4 traffic on top of an IPv6 only network. So they want an IPv6 only network. They don't want routers that do MAP. They want servers in a data center that do MAP. They want to put as many servers as they need to serve the customers, but then IPv4 traffic is doomed to decrease. So they want to, little by little, remove the servers and not trash them. They, I mean, they can disable those BR map servers and use them for something else. So it's, it's very flexible. You can scale it as you need and put that in a, in a corner of your network in a data center. Uh, it helps for flexible deployment, binary API, so for controlling stuff. Um, and the reason why, on the other side, why VPP, uh, why map is good for VPP is because it's stateless. Um, map, as it uses an algorithmic binding, it's very gentle on the cache. Uh, you don't need to, uh, with lightweight 4 over 6, you need to keep a table of binding. Well, you can do it, we do it, it's still line rate. But map is a little bit better because uh, you use CPU operations in order to, to do the mapping, mapping not uh, look up in tables. So, a little bit more interesting for you. Where you can put your nodes if you want to, to, to make a new feature in VPP. This is one of, her, of the first thing you want to know, um, where, do, where you can plug your nodes. So the first one is the one you saw the yesterday and the day before for MaxWap. Very raw way to get packets is to just take every single packet that comes from an interface. You will probably not want to do that because uh, VPP has a great forwarding algorithm. I mean, a FIB, it works really well. So you have diff other ways to get uh, your nodes to, to, get your, to get packets. It's L, uh, the L2 features. So basically, you can enable on a per interface basis um, a feature, which is a node. And every time there is a packet that goes on that interface on an L2 bridge in VPP, well, at some point, that node is going to get the packet, and once it processes the packet, it can either 
keep going in the features or just intercept the packet and, and do something completely different it, uh, with it. Same principle with L3 feature, but it's, uh, it's at the IP lookup node that that happens. You can add your node as a L3 feature, and your node is going to get the packet at some point. The you know the L3 fe feature path that there's a there's a very obvious order there's one you know array initializer that yep. that dictates the order the other one are, are you going to mention the classifier because that's another exact way of doing this uh, no uh, okay well yeah, that's or... that's the dot 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 <laughs> is the uh, is the is the, the 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 classifier engine I mean Jeff's actually playing games doing exactly that so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the classifier and and the adjacency which is part of the FIB yep. uh, and this is we use this one for for map. Um, and the reason why we could use this one is because uh, it's a translation. So we get an IPv6 packet on one side, and our node is going to generate an IPv4 packet on the other side. So the features, uh, the, the, the L3 features are great when you have a series of things to do on your packet before forwarding. Our case was a little bit different uh, because you you, you get an IPv6 packet. Well, in that case, it's, you get an IPv4 packet. You perform uh, encapsulation, so you create an IPv6 packet, and that, then you want this IPv6 packet to be um, to be forwarded just like an IPv6 packet. So, for instance, this is one of the first things you are going to do when you want to uh, create a feature in VPP, uh, like try to sketch how it's going to, what what are going to be your nodes that you want to use that you are going to execute, and What's interesting uh, to first understand is that your graph node is going to look more or less to the branches of your algorithm, your different cases. Um, you have seen what a dual loop is. Dual loop is a way to get about, I don't know, 30, you, you, can, you, you can get 30% uh, performance gain by implementing a dual loop. But the dual loop uh, requires you to not have that many branches. And um, Christian yesterday said as well that for optimizing code, it's better to not have that many branches because you are going to lose cycles if your branch doesn't get executed. So you, you, you want to, to sketch this, this graph. You're probably not going to get it right the first time. Um, well, at least I didn't, we didn't. Uh, it's something that you, you will try first. You will implement something, and then you will get, oh, I have too much too many branches, I got it wrong. Um, I need to create this node for a particular task and so on. Um, one thing you will also want to do is to clearly state what is your fast path. And that fast path, you want to avoid as many branches as, as, you, as you can. You want to put predict true or predict false uh, before all your, your tests in order to optimize this path. And the rest, you know, is just secondary um, because it's going to be a very small amount of traffic. Um, for instance, this is, the, this is what happens. I mean, the packet goes there when it's a fragment. And sometimes when, when it is a fragment, well, you need to cache it because you can't take a decision instantly. You have to wait a little bit. Um, so about fragmented packets, we, we, we need a fragment cache. So it's, it's really easy to cache packets. I mean, when your, when your node gets a packet, it can decide to not give it to a next node. This is bad, evil. I mean, you're going to call your cache. So you only want to do that if you absolutely have to, because some milliseconds after that, I mean, your packet is going to be fetched again, and it's going to create a lot of uh, cache misses. But we, we have no choice. If you use map, you can disable fragment cache, and all packets are going to, for, uh, to be forwarded uh, instantly, at, I mean, all fragments, at the condition that the first fragment is received first. And for that, we use, a, we use a table as well, but it doesn't store packets. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an option. You can just enable, disable it. And so our IPv4 map uh, node gets packet. It sends them to uh, IP6 lookup. This is a way to optimize it even further. You, you, you have two choices. In some cases, if you have additional feature on the IPv6 lookup that you need to apply on your packet, you want the packet to go to IP6 lookup. But if you if if what you want is VPP to just do map and nothing else on bare metal and so on, well, you can just send the packet to IP6 rewrite directly to ad adjacency. It's going to create the Ethernet header, and you just bypass this node, so you can you you have a little a little performance gain. 
actually, you know, the, the, the mechanics there, you set the, uh, you know, the, I, the IPC, the IPTX adjacency and directly throw it, it's IP6 rewrite, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, just so everybody knows the mechanics of doing something like that if they want to. Yeah, uh, usually it's IP6 lookup that sends the packet to IP6 rewrite, but any node can do that. At the condition, it, it sets the, the, the adjacency yeah. correctly in the, um, in the VNet buffer. Yes, sorry. If the, oh well, that's uh, that's one of the cases where, you know, you have to be careful. <laughs> uh, you, you can have a you can have a callback, uh, I think, when the interface goes down. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The so question was what happens when the interface goes down, and so the I have exactly uh, yep. the incaps have the, exactly the same problem. The driver, the driver layer is almost certainly bright enough to throw the packets on the floor for you. If you say, you know, uh, the trouble is if they're re if 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 you've you know faked out the rewrite stage completely, mm. you know, uh, try it with the debug image and make sure it doesn't assert when you do that. Well, for instance, if the adjacency you were using disappears, then you will have a yeah. You well, then then you're absolutely going to get an assert failure, and yeah. it's one re one re you know, there's a whole sequence of tricks that are of the form. Uh, you know, by you know, bypassing checks, bypassing kind of the normal path, and funny things happen. Like, oh, the adjacency just disappeared out from under you. Mm -hmm. Now, the adjacency is being ref counted. You can prevent that if you're a little sneaky. But <laughs> dot dot dot, you might want want to do that. I was about to ask Damian actually because he said he's working on this. I'm guessing he will be able. Will you be able to catch this sort of things when the interface goes down? The adjacency uh -oh. will. Yeah. So. <laughs> and we got to play, play past the mic here. <laughs> okay. And <clears throat> so my idea is really to to completely uh, put our uh, rib as a kind of uh, layer between the fib and the uh, other other uh, components, and then the, the rib layer will basically take take care to remove and install adjustments based on the on the link state. So I guess so. I, I don't know exactly details here. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So, I know if we look at the so so the previous graph was what happens when you get an IPv4 packet. Well, for an IPv6 packet, uh, IPv6 packet, it's almost the same thing. Uh, you have fragmentation if your packet is too big. You have reassembly if your packet is a fragment. You have some ICMP stuff, the fast pass, the optimization, and as always, error drop. I put there. Every node is basically going to drop packets if, if it's necessary. Um, now, just a few words about uh, MAPT. So MAPT is a slightly different beast, but the, you know, the algorithm is the same. The most of the things are the same, but it's doing translation instead of uh, encapsulation. And well, a small difference like that, encapsulation versus translation, gives you a graph that is very different. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting difference is the fact that we actually had to classify traffic. So it's exactly the case where I said, you're not going to get your graph right the first time. So first, I tried the same approach with MAPI, and I had so many branches. Um, yeah, because your operation with translation are the same. If it's uh, TCP, uh, ICMP, um, or, or if your packet is fragmented. So we basically have these three cases, uh, independent cases. This is obviously the fast path, uh, UDP, TCP, uh, and ICMP translation is a pain, so you want it to be in a different node. And that's going to be the next slide, I think. Yeah, so one of the main difference between VPP and silicon is that you can offer some code that is going to be executed 0.001% uh, of the time, like ICMP translation. This is just a complete mess. You don't even want to optimize it because it's too complicated anyway, but you want to optimize your UDP TCP code. So you put them in different nodes. The, the UDP TCP, you optimize it, you do the dual loop. I'm, I'm going to show a little bit of code later. And the ICMP code, well, you, you don't care that much. But in, in the execution path, they, they are equal citizens. You don't need, there is no punting, no, nothing like that. Just the code is in the same place, executed by the same CPUs, and so on. Um, and 
stop there. Um, what, what VPP is great for, as I mentioned, is for uh, prototyping, testing, standardization as well, um, and shipping and de debugging. You can maintain uh, more easily. So step four, make fun of hardware. So I'm, go I'm going to make you work a little bit and see if you can uh, guess what happened here. So this, this was a bug uh, we saw in a hardware platform implementing map. So basically it was receiving IPv4 ICMP pings on one side and, and everything was going fine for TCP, UDP, but for ICMP instead of going to the right CP because remember uh, with, with map the ports are shared. So you, lo you look at the, you, you would basically look at the destination port here um, to guess what is the right CP you should forward the packet to and, and with ICMP for no apparent reason, it was sending to CPs in a random fashion, just randomly. So can anybody guess what happened? Somebody want to try, try? Well, it's okay, map is not easy to get the first time. But what happened is UDP header, the port is here. TCP header, the port is here. ICMP, the checksum is here. So the, the hardware-based solution was doing the, the, the easy thing, just, okay, UDP, TCP is most of my traffic. I mean, it was a bug, it has been solved now, but they, they just expected the destination port to be here. And here it was the checksum. So the checksum, as you send pings, the sequence number was uh, incrementing, so the checksum was changing. So it, was, it looked basically random here. So what? Uh, this is what we did for our tests. So this setup, it looks a little bit like what uh, Damian and Maciek did with a big, big server with tons of 40 gigs uh, NICs. Hower is slightly different. We have 10, 10 gigs NICs only. We are not only doing uh, forwarding, but as well map. And I mean, th this was using Ixia uh, for sending traffic. We, we were testing, and Map is basically performing uh, line rate uh, on, on that setup. So, uh, and we use you know CPUs that are doing nothing. So it's not really um, it just just works well. Uh, one word as well about Ixia. I'm going to show uh, right after a little demo about how I do to to uh, test the code. Um, Ixia obviously has great features but it's expensive, and <laughs> there is one feature that it does not have, I mean, uh, IX network, because I don't want to say mistake, but IX load <coughs> does have the feature, but IX network do cannot send pickup packets, uh, pick, pick up uh, files packets. And when I do something new, basically like map, I mean, uh, I actually tried to ask Ixia guys, can you, can you help me with map packet? They are a bit weird. It's a IPv4 encapsulated packet in IPv6. The ports are algorithmically bounded one each other. So, okay, can you help me? No. Can you provide me an API such that I can do that? No. So in, instead I use DPDK packet generator, which is free, has way, way, way less features. It, it's, I mean, TPDK packet generator is kind of stupid, but it can send a pickup file. Um, How about the configuration? So uh, it can send a pickup file. I, I checked yesterday, um, but I didn't try it. But I think uh, I, I'm not really impressed by the t uh, the amount of time IPv6 is mentioned in the in the documentation. So I'm not sure how they handle IPv6 traffic. Uh, so, demo time. Um, so this is how I test my stuff. I have a server, uh, a few NICs, and I basically loop back the NICs so that on one side I, say I use packet generator to send packet, and on the other side uh, I put VPP. Um, so for instance, one of these wires is used for IPv4 traffic, the other wire is used for IPv6 traffic. And so, um, so here you have VPP running, uh, show map domain. I put uh, 100 domains. It's not that mu that much, you know. I just didn't want it to show just one. I put 100, but we tested with uh, thousands. And on the other side, you have um, packet generator, uh, which, as usual, is a bit messed up with the arrays, but doesn't really matter. So when I 
so first, when you develop, you want to test your functionality, make sure it doesn't crash. And once you have your functionality right, I mean, for instance, do not try to implement the dual loop first. First, do the single loop. And then you can try start testing the performances. And I send as many packets as I can on one side. So for, in that case, it's a 10 gig interface, but I'm sending very small packets. Because what I want to know is not how many packets I'm going to have in production. I just want to know how many packets is, uh, is one core. Yeah, precision important. In that setup, it's just one core is forwarding traffic. And I want to know with one core how many packets I'm able to, to, to encapsulate, decapsulate according to map. So 4.5, you see the, on the left side, you see how many packets are sent on one interface. On the other side, you see how many packets are received on the other side. So obviously, there is a lot of packet loss, but that's because I'm sending shitloads of packets on one side. They are, they are very small. So my um, map does 4.5 uh, millions of packets per second, which is on realistically sized, sized packets um, line rate. And so on one, I can start, uh, so in this case, I'm sending IPv4 packet on one side, receiving IPv6 on the other side. I can start IPv6 on the other side. Uh, you see that the performance drops because I have only one core. So one core right now is doing both sides, both translation at the same time. Uh, so now we are at, uh, well, you see the total amount of packet is, uh, well, it's screwed up. Uh, it's it's 3.8 million packets per second. I can stop the other side. So the message being that if you want to do something that is not in Ixia, uh, or, or you don't want to spend the money for an Ixia setup, uh, package generator is cool. Uh, and maybe, yeah, uh, Cisco branded stuff. Uh, you can try T-Rex as well. Um, so this was the demo. O on the right side, uh, on this side, you see uh, HTOP. So I said I'm just using one core, it is true, uh, one VPP core. The four other cores are used by a uh, packet generator because I, I configured it such, such that it has one core TX, one core RX on both interfaces. So VPP is just CPU number one um, in poll mode. Okay, any questions on that? Um, do I have time or should I make it short? Okay. So to show a little bit of code here, uh, this is one of the first things. So I'm in ma uh, IPv6 map E, so encapsulation, uh, single loop. I have the dual loop right before, but it's not interesting. Uh, you see the, um, the, the enqueuing. Um, how is it called already? Like, what's the? Speculative in queue, speculative, thank you. Uh, and that is basically what does decapsulation. I mean, it's as easy, uh, actually it's that. That line by itself does decapsulation. Everything else is just uh, exception uh, exception and security checks because in, uh, in, in map you, in order to do this, um, to, to make sure CPs are not spoofing traffic using IPv4 addresses that, are, that, are, that, that they are not allowed to use, you need to do some, some checks. So you look at the, the domain and all this here is just uh, exception and link like I, ICMPv6, uh, fragmentation uh, and so on. And this is, for instance, a good example of uh, use, it's using fragmentation. So, sorry, this code uh, here. So in that case, your packet is too big. You need to send it to the fragmentation node instead of the lookup node. So yesterday, Dave told you about uh, VNet buffer structure, which has a big union with tons of stuff. Uh, IP, for, uh, IP fragmentation is one example of those node nodes that use this structure. So you're going to fill it with a few arguments telling, okay, where is the header, a few flags that you can set. Uh, once I'm done with a fragmentation, where should I send the packet to? In that case, it's uh, IP4 lookup because I decapsulated, now I have an IP4 packet. And you have obviously to say what is the MTU you'd expect for, uh, for fragmentation. So you tell the fragmentation node, I want packets not bigger than that. Uh, so this is one example. And you see, you want to avoid 
branches. This, this is actually not as good as it could be. Like if I look at the um, dual loop, well, this is not a good example. This is, this is not really good. But sometimes you, you, you don't really have a choice. We are not going to send a packet to a different node just for these uh, few operations. But in other cases, like for instance, the, the decapsulation, well, the amount of operation, this is, this is nice because you can really take advantage of your CPU uh, pipelining. No, that was yesterday's presentation. If you do stuff in parallel, I mean, it, uh, if at some point you have a cache miss for both packets, well, you have a cache miss, but you're going to fetch both at the same time. So you basically divided the cost of your cache miss by two. Um, so uh, map E is not performing, performing that many oper operations um, when it comes to translation. So this, for instance, is the ICMP translation I, I told you about. It is a mess. It is complete mess, but you don't care because it's not going to be executed that much. And it's free because it's code, it's not hardware. Um, but if we look at the, um, at the fast path, which is, um, so this is fragmented packets, uh, TCP UDP. So this is the, this is 99% of uh, your, your traffic. And this is nice. So this is a dual loop where you have no branches whatsoever. Uh, a little bit of checksum work because it's translation. Translation is bad, so you have to do all these operations, but it works pretty well with, um, with um, dual loop here. Uh, and you do all these operations. And in case of exceptions, predict false, predict false, and I do a bunch of stuff again, all operations. Yep. Uh, I didn't look at it. Yeah. Hmm? Oh yeah. Uh, the question is, did I look at uh, offloading the checksum? Uh, no, I didn't. But if you have suggestions, I, I don't know why I should do that. So please help. <laughs> uh, offloading with IPv6 is that we notice that many NICs are not dealing properly with uh, extension headers and such stuff. Mm. So what the easier thing was just to disable it. Okay, so I guess that's all for the code. I could show you um, IPv4 map. No, the, okay. I think I said what I had to say. Yeah. Okay, so, and thanks very much for that. That was cool. When you were going through this, right, and you, you had your problem, you had an algorithm you wanted to implement, and you chose to do it on BPP, what was probably the hardest thing to get your head around, and how did you kind of overcome it? Because you got the implementation done, so what was what did you personally just find the hardest bit for you to get your head around? The hardest with BPP in general is the is the learning curve, but at the very beginning. But can you think of a specific in that learning curve in the very, like what was it that it was your first stumbling block and once you got past that, you were cool? Just learn the, the vectors, the pools, all that stuff. Oh, no, one thing actually, yes. Biggest, <laughs> most, most horrible thing, and everybody is going to agree on it. These, these macros here modify the value of the variables you put in there. Yeah. And, and understanding basically the, uh, the speculative NQ and what happens if you, when you do get next frame, yeah. uh, put next, uh, validate NQ, all that stuff, these macros are modifying the, these variables. Yep. And that's very that's misleading. <laughs> so uh, yeah, understanding the, the dual loop and uh, these macros are a bit challenging. And before that, yeah, the, the general learning curve, yeah. the nodes, uh, themselves, the architecture is a, is a, is a blessing. It's really great. Um, so I have a okay, conclusion. I'm starting to crawl out from under the desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I um, and, and Pierre, to, to amplify on that, I've heard, I've heard the same comment in any number of times. I mean, 
at, at a certain level, if you're willing to say, OK, I'm going to take as, a theory, take as an axiom that this actually works and not worry too much about it, that, that, that uh, you know, there's a reason for the boilerplate generator. Some people don't try to code that, that stuff themselves the first time. But yeah, I've, I've heard that exact comment before. It's like, well, what, what, what are these ugly ass macros all about? And <laughs> but but what, once you get used to it, it's, uh, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, you rapidly get to the oh yeah, I, I, you know, I know, I know that I'm side, you know, side affecting, uh, you know, the, you know, and you know, n left to next, uh, you know, uh, two next variables in particular when you do yeah. that. Maybe you should put a comment, comment on the code now that you document. document yeah. Okay, could we not have doc comments about th about that sort of stuff? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally get it. If you want to send those comments, but we don't need to enter, you know. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the demo, maybe I didn't pay enough in uh, attention. In the demo with the package generator, do you have a latency measurement? No, that's one of the things you don't have with package generator and that you get with using Ixia. Okay. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a branch of package gen which has latency mm -hmm. measurement in it. So, but but my, I think my essential, my question is, uh, what do you, did you measure the latency of your uh, project, of your uh, um, Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely did in the XCR setup. Uh, I don't remember the number. Okay. Yeah. Machik, on the other hand, has a whole pile of late, latency and jitter measurements that he's going to put up later in the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, Machik? Yeah. Hey, hey yeah. Machik, quick. <laughs> hey, Majek. So, uh, story is you're going to put up some latency and jitter measurements later in the day, right? Uh, Hello. Yep. <laughs> I, well, we, we're going to have a running demo with uh, Xia. So, uh, yes, on the screen. Cool. On the slides, only the captures from Dave, which Dave asked me to uh, debunk. So that's what I'm going to do. Cool. Which wiki? I don't know Sorry, I don't know the context. <coughs> okay, so, I, uh, sure. So the video will be videoing everything. Uh, screen captures are allowed and encouraged. Um, we are measuring performance, which includes benchmarking throughput, mm -hmm. zero packet loss, latency, uh, latency variation, and uh, max, mean, average, and percentile values. But we do not have everything automated in SysIt yet. The values are available, what we uh, measure. I will cover this in more detail during uh, my session. Thank you. So I'm almost done. Yeah, oh, OK. Uh, do you guys uh, do the iMix, or uh, you guys measure yeah. the 64 byte of data? So for can, we, uh, can we just cover that in the CC? Yeah. You'll go to okay. ad nauseum detail. All back. Okay, yeah. because I'm more interested in 64 byte because please, that's. Uh, please leave the questions when I do, and so we're going to answer all the questions. And, and on my side, uh, as I said, for development and my, my own testing as the efficiency of my code, I, I use very small packets such that I can send as many as I want. Uh, but once, when you do real performance testing, then yeah, my check is going to tell all this. Uh, speaking of the code, this is one of the weirdest and coolest thing I've seen ever uh, in, in a C code. Um, I'm not going to explain what that does and how cool it is, but, uh, or maybe I will, seeing your faces. So it, it's basically just a way to say, uh, you're going to use this macro in different places, creating arrays, creating logs, uh, next node, and so on, or a bunch of stuff. So. When, if I want to add an error, I just need to modify one line, add one line, and this is going to, to be used in every other places where you have something that is specific to the whole list of errors. And I mean, it's the, the programming, uh, I mean, using this kind of macros, it's really, really handy. And for instance, here, you see an enum, an, an enum structure um, type generated from this for each. And in some different place in the code, you generate the array of uh, strings using the same for each. I think the message is if you don't like the preprocessor, BTP is not for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my conclusion, uh, and I tried to put a few advices, although I'm... Sorry, sorry, did that mention... 
Th that's one thing that I didn't get. I'm not sure if it's the right time now, but maybe uh, if it's a quick answer. Uh, I saw that you kind of um, redefined the underscore macro all over the place. What's the idea behind that? If it's quick, if it's a quick answer. Yeah, thanks. Okay, the yeah the un the uh, underscore macro. Uh, how many people have ever played with a Lisp lambda function? That's exact. It's the underscore macro is exactly a Lisp lambda function that I have a macro and then I instantiate briefly the underscore macro being a lazy ty typist. This is actually an Elliot Dresselhaus trick. You've seen his name on the code. He was, um, you know, my off and on and original collaborator in this work. At any rate, um, it's a Lisp lambda function that you say, okay, here's you know a macro that you know has things like an enum name, a string name, um, some value, and I'll instantiate the underscore macro once to say, okay, now I want an enum out of it. Now I want a parallel ve you know vector of strings where I'm just not using you know using the first argument. So the under it's it's exactly a Lisp lambda function game. You know it's. You know, again, some, uh, you know, the gentleman over here had it exactly right. If you don't like the preprocessor, this might not be the best place for you to play. Could, could this stuff all be done a different way? Yeah, sure. Gu uh, you know, uh, Guilty is charged for abusing the preprocessor a little, but I don't particularly hate the preprocessor. At any rate. Thanks. Uh, so these are very humble. I mean, very humbly. I'm just, I, I'm not such an experienced uh, developer. So I just tried to put a few things that came into my mind. Uh, you know what we say about early optimization? Uh, I mean, VPP is highly, uh -huh. highly optimized. Do your uh, functionality test first. Do not try the dual loop first. E even though I think you said once you get used to it, you can do directly dual loop. That's Dave Barak. Um, yeah. I, I cannot do that. <laughs> well, Pierre, but you're exactly right. I mean, you know, the message is, is, is spot on, which is do the, do the single loop first, get the thing to be functionally correct, and then it's basically a mechanical job that you can do while watching, you know, watching football, uh, basketball, your favorite sport, <laughs> where you say, okay, there's a, there's a little bit of a gig that says in a lot of places, if you name your variable, you know, IP zero, yeah. next zero, blah, 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 then it's just, it, it's, it's a really easy, you know, uh, pick up the variable definitions from the single loop, splat them down in the dual loop, you know, have next zero and friends have, you know, have one baby. It's like the old a violinist uh, or violist joke. What do you call a violist with two brain cells? And the answer is pregnant. Um, at any <laughs> rate, they're, they're, the, they're the, the, the whipping, you know, the whipping people of the orchestra. But yeah, but that's exactly right. Do the single loop first. I do, I do that. And I've been, you know, I would really almost never try to dual loop something until I had it functionally correct. Even though when you create the single loop, also think about you know the branches and so on, such that it can be dual looped, and yeah. and and if you see that it can't, maybe that is because you need one more node. You need to create a, a node branch instead of relying on uh, ifs. Yeah. Um, then perf top, but I think Macheki may be going to show that it's uh, it's a way you can see in your code. Uh, so Macheki, well. I'm going to yeah, very if you can just crank up perf, perf top, it'll yep. be it'll be actually instructive. Yep. So this is what it looks like. So for instance, in my case, I have map running. So you will see IP6 input, uh, some lookup, and here you see IP6 map, IP4 lookup because uh, we are doing IP4 as well. Um, so if I look at IP6 map, I can see directly very easily where the most work is done. And for instance, here I have a hot point in um, a prefetch instruction. Uh, so maybe there is something wrong here. That's, that's why we need people like Dave Barak to <laughs> Yeah. To tell us what's going I, on. on it, honestly, that usually that usually means the things out of you know, out of load store bandwidth in a way. Mm. But the the first thing to say is you're you're on about the uh, about the tenth function down down there. If you wanted to go back to the global profile, in other words, um, you know, go go back to the global profile for a sec. This one. Yeah, that one. Okay, what's the top guy doing? And none of, none of that looks, you know, yeah, if we were to zoom into RecV raw packets vec, I'd love to see what that one's up to. 
And then, yeah, just do this guy. Okay. All right. Okay. That's, that's, this is, the, um, that's the vector. Okay, DPDK guy, that, that looks like the, that looks like the vector unit sucking a descriptor. So you've got some, P, the, so that the real rate limiter looks like PCI, you know, in, in this computation rather than anything else. Because this is, this, is, this is almost certainly sucking a, you know, yeah. sucking a, a, a descriptor off the RX ring most like. It's the received path. So I haven't seen that one particularly, but. Yeah. Maybe I have a PCI issue in my, in yeah, my setup. Like, could be, but that's not, that's not what the profiles I typically look at mm -hmm. uh, look, look like quite, that that's not usually the guy who's stalling. So, Oops. you know, we'd have to go work okay. out what exactly is wrong. But yeah, at, at any rate, with a practice die, you can make pretty rapid progress on what's going on. But that sure looks like he's, he's stalling on descriptors a lot. So I think Maciek is going to say a bit more about perf top. So, uh, um, to finish, Think about IPv6, please. Uh, it would be great if VPP could stay, uh, you know, same functionalities for v IPv4 and IPv6. And please think about Jumbo frames as well, because usually when people develop one node, they do the, the, the easy way of not looking. So Jumbo frame development speaking is when you have buffers that are chained together. It's usually not that hard to think about it and make the few changes that you need to, to do in order for them to work. It's easy to make them when you are fresh in the code, but you know, one month later, uh, it's complicated for someone else to do it or for even yourself to do it. Uh, so think now, about it the first time. To be fair about it, Pierre, a lot of things like adding a tunnel and cap, you, you need to think about it exactly yeah. zero. You had the, uh, the complication of doing the reassembly stuff, which you know, gets to be more yeah. complicated. In my case, I have fragmentation, yeah. uh, translation, uh, which sometimes need to look at the whole packet. Um, and when you do a driver, yeah. obviously, yeah, you yeah. need to, to do that, or the host user, or tap interfaces, and so on. Yeah, you, you've, you've rooted around in places where a lot of people yeah. don't actually go. But <laughs> as I said, to just paste on a tunnel and cap, uh, you probably won't ever even be aware of it with any lock. So that's my last, last, last slide. <coughs> Magic? Yeah, Pierre, can you go back, back to the previous slide? Something you said, think. Can we do s slash think slash do slash? <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Do. Don't try, don't think, just do. Thanks. Six is good <laughs> for business and internet. Uh, so my main message was in the beginning that VPP is really different from our hardware because it's great for, uh, well, for the very early stage of standardization then prototyping, then uh, debugging, trying, shipping, maintaining. All that is made simpler by the software. Um, as I said, the learning curve is pretty steep, but you will, you will go past it if you, if you are... Uh, f well, for us, it was our first project to myself and Ule Troan, and it took us just one month to do it. So in the very beginning, and actually one, I, I, my first contact with VPP was uh, more than one year ago, and I was like, oh, no way. It was really complicated to use, but it has evolved a lot. Now it's really much simpler. And, and the first time you look at the code, you are, yeah, indeed, do a loop, what the fuck, um, the, the weird macros, what the fuck, and so on. But you get used to, the, to it, and actually you get to love that as well. It's really... Uh, Great, great piece of software. I only had to pay him one week's paycheck to say all this stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and what's great, I mean, that's just me, but I love learning about this, these optimizations. And it's really great to see that we can push the software mm. f further than what most people would think we can. And that's all. <laughs>